Good afternoon. I'm Adeline calling, I'm not calling from anywhere really, but that's what it feels like sometimes in these kinds of presentations. Hi, I'm Madeline from the Office of Civics and Community Services. Joining us today from Inner City Law um, are their legal team, and they're here today to talk about tenants' rights. Please remember that this presentation is to provide general information and resources, and it's not personal legal advice. Um, contact information will be provided throughout. You're welcome to ask questions, and our presenters will do their best to answer or refer you to their respective agencies. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm Indira Cameron Banks, and I'm the directing attorney of the Lawyers Preventing and Ending Homelessness Project at the Inner City Law Center. And today, members of our legal teams will talk to you about your rights as a tenant. And as Madeline said, this is to provide you with a general overview and should not be considered personal legal advice. I also want to stress that since the legal landscape is constantly changing at this time, please consider this information uh, presented here today, uh, current as of today, March 3rd, 2021. And it may be different in the future as the laws change. Uh, with that, let me introduce you to our first two speakers. Uh, Anthony Vanadis is an attorney with our tenant defense team, our tenant defense project. And Deanna DeCosimo is an attorney with the Preventing and Ending Homelessness Project. Uh, Anthony, uh, let's start with you. Perhaps you could talk to, uh, to our viewers uh, who have all heard about an eviction moratorium. Uh, does that mean uh, that tenants in LA can't be evicted during the pandemic? Well, thank you, Indira, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, no. No, there, I just want to stress that there is no moratorium. At best, it's a deferment, but it's not a moratorium. Um, if we could go to slide three, please. So these are limited tenant protections during the pandemic. Um, this is a list of them beginning uh, with the CDC protection. Um, so I'll quickly and briefly go over each of those. But the, the key takeaway is that don't believe that there's a, there's no moratorium. You still have to respond if you're served with uh, an unlawful detainer complaint, someone's in complaint. Um, and then of course, if you're served also with a notice. So CDC protection is kind of, we use as a last resort. Basically you have to, you have to state under penalty of perjury that you're trying to make your best efforts to pay the rent, uh, but you can't do it because of COVID related reasons that you'll be imminently homeless. Um, if, you, if you're evicted from, from your residence. And so it's kind of, an, uh, again, a, a, a last resort sort of thing. Um, AB 3088, it was, kind of, it was the previous state law, California state law, that's basically been extended by SB 91. So AB 3088 and SB 91 provide that specifically, first of all, that you have just cause protections um, as long as you're in obviously California, just cause protections to all, um, all residences. Also, if you're able, if you're unable to pay the rent um, between the months of going, and this goes way back to March 1st of 2020 through June of 2021, if you're unable to pay your rent during that, those time periods, uh, you could, you have to sign a declaration that should be provided by your landlord. Um, attesting that you're unable to pay the rent because of COVID related reasons. Um, and what that means then is by June 30th, 2021, you will have to pay 25% of the rent that you've deferred due to COVID related reasons. So you could either pay it monthly, the 25% monthly, or by June 30th, 2021, you have to pay the total amount that you were unable to pay. Uh, but 25% of that amount totally. County protections, um, LA County has some, has some some strong protections, same with LA city protections. Uh, specifically with the, with the city and county protections, you have 12 months following the end of the declaration of, emer of the local emergency to repay your, your back rent. Um, additionally, county protections, the LA county protections and LA city protections 
Also add that if you have unauthorized occupants that are there because of COVID related reasons, meaning such as they had to vacate their other residence because someone there did get contracted COVID-19 and they're temporarily staying with you at this point, um, that's allowable. So they, uh, the landlord can't evict you based on that, on that reason. Similarly with pets as well. So those are additional and there also are more protections as well under the city and county um, ordinances. Um, other key takeaways are if you live in other cities, check with your cities, uh, your, your websites, city government websites, see if they have their own sort of um, moratoriums or, or um, temporary, and again, they're temporary um, uh, to prevent evictions. Um, uh, going on to the next question. Okay, uh, let's throw the next question out. Uh, Deanna, can you uh, explain how um, some tenants can make sure to qualify for these uh, limited COVID-19 uh, protections? Sure, so, you know, I'll probably repeat some stuff that Anthony said, um, but you're generally encouraged to pay 25% of your rent and submit a declaration to your landlord. Information about your rent and the declaration form can be found at www.stayhousela.org slash tenant underscore rights. If you owe rent between March 2020 and August 2020, you must give your landlord a declaration that you can't pay rent due to COVID-19. If you owe rent between September 2020 and June 2021, one, you must give your landlord a declaration for each month stating you can't pay the full rent, and two, pay 25% of total rent for those months by June 30th, 2021. You should be providing the declaration each month that you're unable to pay the rent in full. Protections are in place until June 30th, 2021. If a residential tenant, a residential tenant's inability to pay rent is not directly related to COVID-19, you still may be protected under the CDC order and should comply with the certification requirements under that order. For more information on AB 3088 and SB 91 and the CDC order, you can visit www.housingiskey.com and www.cdc.gov slash coronavirus slash 2019 dash C-O-V slash COVID dash eviction dash declaration dot HTML. Thanks. We will put up some of those uh, websites uh, to uh, as we move along. Uh, Deanna, can you just uh, clarify a point? When, uh, when are tenants supposed to notify the landlord that they are unable to pay rent? Well, under the law, you're only required to provide a declaration in response to a landlord giving you a 15-day notice. But we recommend that you go on the stayhousela.org website and download the declaration and send it before your due date. There's many reasons for this. Um, one, if the landlord knows your situation, they're less likely to harass you. Two, once you notify them of the situation, the anti-harassment laws kick in. And three, sometimes landlords will say they gave you a notice when they didn't. Then it becomes a debate in court. You may as well send the declaration before your due date and um, make sure you can, you can prove it by getting a proof of mailing and sending it by both mail and email or follow the instructions to the declaration once again on the stayhousedla.org website. And whether you have a certain number of days to notify your landlord of your inability to pay depends on where you live. You should notify your landlord as soon as you know you're unable to pay your rent. If you haven't told your landlord that you cannot pay rent due to the pandemic, you should do that immediately in writing, even if your rent is past due. If you do not inform your landlord of your inability to pay due to COVID-19, you may not be able to use this as a defense if an eviction case is filed against you. You should contact an attorney at stayhousela.org um, because they can provide you with a sample letter to use. Don't forget to date and sign the letter and save a copy and save any responses from your landlord. Um, Anthony, so just to clarify, is a tenant supposed to continue paying rent um, 
And are they, go I know you explained it a little bit, maybe you could highlight that again. Um, will the tenant need to pay back that rent? And if you could explain a little bit of when that's supposed to happen and how it's supposed to happen. Sure, so as, as, as uh, Deanna and I had previously mentioned, if you're having difficulty paying rent for reasons related to COVID-19 between the months of March, 2020, in June of 2021, you have um, several options. Um, first and foremost, as you said, you know, notify your landlord as soon as possible um, that you're unable to to pay the rent. Go on stayhousela.org if your landlord doesn't provide you with a, a declaration form. Download the declaration form, fill it out, sign it, um, and then basically each month, as as Deanna said, you will have to submit um, the declaration form. And that lasts that period through June of 2021. So by June 30th of 2021, you have had to have paid 25% of the total rent that was owed from the period that you were unable to pay rent, um, as long as you notified the landlord um, for those months. Um, and do you have a second part, Indira, was question? Or? Um, yeah, so let me ask you also, uh, does the tenant, if if a landlord demands a tenant enter into a repayment agreement now, um, does that tenant have to do that? No, not at all. Um, so long as they comply, the tenant complies with the state program, the state law, um, SB 91, and the predecessor AB uh, 91, um, or excuse me, AB 3088. As long as you comply with those, um, which are, again are the 25% monthly, um, and you fill out the declaration, that's sufficient. That doesn't mean you can't enter a repayment agreement. It just means you're not required to. Thank you, guys. Um, next, let's talk to some other attorneys um, about a, a different set of questions. Um, Maybe Camilla and uh, Sarah, if we could have them come and answer some questions for us. Excellent. Um, Camilla Dudley is an attorney with the Preventing and Ending Homelessness Project. And, uh, <laughs> and we are, also going to introduce uh, a different Sarah. We have multiple Sarahs uh, at at our <laughs> at Inner City Law Center. Um, let Let's see if if um, Sarah can can join us. There you go. Uh, Sarah Saraj is a senior paralegal, um, also with the Preventing and Ending Homelessness Project. Uh, thank you guys for for joining us. Um, so let me ask you camilla if you can explain uh what does a tenant have to show a landlord in order to prove that they can't pay rent does the tenant have to show the landlord any documents uh proving that they can't pay rent thanks indira so first i'll answer the question um do you have to show your landlord any specific documents and your landlord is allowed to ask for bank statements, for example, but you're not required to provide bank statements. You're allowed to provide a lot of other forms of documentation that can demonstrate your inability to pay rent during uh, or due to COVID-19. If you reside in the city of Los Angeles, however, you don't need to provide your landlord with any proof of your inability to pay. So now I'll answer your question, what sorts of documents uh, should a tenant be saving to show that they can't pay rent because of the pandemic? And the short answer to that question is that you should save, if you're a tenant, you should save anything that shows you either made less money or spent more money because of the pandemic. And I'll give a few examples of what that documentation would look like. So you should save all communications from your employer, such as letters or emails or text messages, um, save any termination notices or pay stubs. And if your earning varies by day or by week, um, you can keep a calendar of how much you made uh, per day or per week. 
save your bank statements, save medical bills, childcare bills, utility bills. If you have any letters from your doctor stating that you or someone close to you has been diagnosed with COVID-19, save receipts for any supplies bought specifically in order to respond to the virus, such as hand sanitizer or um, special cleaning supplies. Save receipts for all necessities, such as food and transportation that you purchased while the emergency order was in place. So again, save anything that shows you made less money or spent more money because of the pandemic. Is there anything uh, special? I know a lot of tenants are at this time working as independent contractors. Is there anything that they should be concerned about saving um, at this time? Yeah, so if you're an independent contractor, be sure to save any communications you have with clients showing that they canceled your services while the emergency order was in place. So you can save past bank statements showing that you earned more money before the pandemic than you earned during the pandemic. And you can also save printouts from mobile payment services such as Venmo, Cash App, and Zelle showing that you earned more money for work before the pandemic than you earned during the pandemic. And you can also save monthly summary of earning statements um, from companies you contract for, such as Uber and Lyft provide those. And again, if your earnings vary by day or by week, make sure to keep a calendar of how much you're making. So with this, I wanted to um, you know, invite Sarah to talk to us a little bit. I think there are a lot of tenants that are just struggling uh, financially at this time. Uh, Sarah, could you explain some of the general options that uh, tenants might be able to explore to help them out right now? Sure. Thanks, Indira. Uh, there's a number of options, um, different categories of benefits, um, depending on what the needs are. Um, just a note that uh, government agencies are really backed up right now, um, even more so during the pandemic. So things are taking longer to process. Um, so just to hang in there with that. Uh, if you need cash aid um, from the county, there's uh, general relief, which is for uh, adults without minor children, and then CalWORKs for adults with minor children. And uh, CalWORKs also has additional special programs for people um, experiencing homelessness or at imminent risk of homelessness. And I've listed uh, links and the phone number for these programs, um, although if at all possible, uh, doing it online is more thorough and efficient if you do have access. Uh, then for food assistance, um, if you need help with groceries, um, there's the CalFresh program, which uh, has historically been known as uh, food stamps. Um, CalFresh is the state version of SNAP, the uh, federal food program. Um, it's important to note that uh, all of these county administered programs, uh, CalFresh, CalWORKs, uh, Medi-Cal are all um, available to children if they are US citizens, even if the parents are undocumented. Um, so immigration status of the parents does not matter. So we really encourage people to apply um, for their children just to get as much help as possible. Um, for groceries, there's uh, a number of pantries throughout the county that are supplied by the LA Food Bank. And I've listed uh, a link for that as well. You can put in your location and it will show you uh, what pantries are the closest. Uh, for disability benefits, um, they're state and federal. So if you have worked recently and are disabled, um, you can apply for state disability insurance, um, just note that you'll have to create an online account with the um, Employment Development Department, and then you will actually submit an application uh, for unemployment um, or disability benefits. Uh, EDD runs both of those programs. Um, if you uh, expect to be unable to work for 12 months or longer, then you would want to apply for SSI and SSDI uh, because the rules are complicated in terms of uh, work credits and financial requirements in addition to being determined. Um, we always advise people to apply for both um, just in case. So uh, first you would apply for 
uh, SSDI online through the Social Security website. I've listed that link there. And then for SSI, uh, unfortunately, you cannot apply online. Um, so you would have to call Social Security and you can do an application over the phone. Um, and that will be a lot easier if you've already done the SSDI uh, application online because they will have asked you questions about your conditions and your treatment and your symptoms and all of that, um, the reasons why you're not able to work. Um, so then uh, for medical care, uh, we have Medi-Cal, which is administered again by the county and um, it's for uh, U.S. citizens or people with qualified immigration status. Um, and again, that's a, a pretty complicated um, area, but just generally uh, anyone with a, even with a pending U or T visa or an application uh, for VAWA status, even if there hasn't been a decision, as long as it's in process, um, you could be eligible for any of those uh, county administered benefits. Um, as in terms of healthcare for uh, undocumented folks, uh, there's My Health LA, and uh, the link is uh, up there as well. Um, so you don't have to just go to, you know, any of the county hospitals like uh, General or uh, Harbor UCLA. There are uh, private clinics um, around the county that can provide medical care. Um, you know, whether it's urgent care or with appointments, you could have a primary care provider. Um, another excellent benefit is uh, in-home supportive services, um, and that's run by the county, by DPSS as well. And that's assistance with tasks um, that, are need, that are needed to help the elderly and disabled stay in their homes. Um, you know, things like grocery shopping, uh, you know, running errands, like, like going to doctor's appointments, um, cleaning, cooking all of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a great benefit to explore as well. And then um, finally, we have uh, unemployment benefits. So um, those again are run by the state, uh, the Employment Development Department, and uh, it's the same uh, EDD website that you would go to uh, for SDI. You would just you know create an account and then um, submit an application as well. And the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance is uh, part of that as well. So if you're wondering about that, specifically um, regular unemployment benefits insurance and then pandemic unemployment are under the same umbrella. Um, so that about covers it for benefits. I uh, hope that was helpful. Thank you both. Um, next, we are going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what happens when the evictions and sort of all the support um, isn't enough. Uh, with us, we have uh, Sarah Kerr, who is an attorney with the uh, Tenant Defense Project at Inner City Law, and Caitlin Tully, who is an attorney with the Preventing and Ending Homelessness Project um, at the Inner City Law Center. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, Sarah, let me let me ask you if you could explain what should a tenant uh, do when they after they tell their landlord they can't pay rent because of the pandemic, but the landlord still tries to evict them. So as we discussed earlier, landlords can still evict tenants because there isn't a moratorium on all evictions. So your landlord could try to evict you for violating a covenant or an agreement in your lease agreement, uh, for example, or move forward with an eviction because even if you told them that you couldn't afford to pay rent because of the pandemic, you didn't submit the proper declarations. So if you think you are being evicted, uh, contact an attorney immediately by going to www.stayhousedla.org. If you live in the city of Los Angeles, you should also file a complaint with the Housing and Community Investments uh, Department at their website, which is hcidla.lacity.org. If you live in an unincorporated area of LA County, contact the LA County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, Consumer Protection Department, and that's dcba.lacounty.gov slash consumer protection. 
it can be confusing if, to know whether your landlord is actually bringing an eviction against you. If your landlord just says that they want you to move out, that isn't the proper notice, but they still might uh, say that it's enough to, give, to bring you an, an eviction. And if, they don't under, and if you don't understand the notices that you've received, these notices to quit, it can be confusing as well because they include a lot of different language and might, might or might not come with the proper declarations. Um, regardless, if your landlord tells you that they're planning on evicting you or they give you one of these notices, go to stayhousedla.org and speak with an attorney so that you can stay in your housing. So what happens or what does it look like, uh, Caitlin, when a landlord actually files a lawsuit? Uh, what, does, what does that mean for, for the tenant? Um, sometimes tenants receive notices to go to court. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what they should be looking for and what they should do. Caitlin, maybe just unmute yourself for briefly. There you go. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So the first thing to note is if you do receive one of the notices that Sarah was just talking about and you haven't received a copy of what you see on the screen, you should still contact the courthouse um, within your address to make sure that an eviction has been filed. And if you be of the summons and complaint, that's what it means. So the done, and you're on a very strict timeline. You'll have five days to submit an answer to the court where you can talk about defenses that you might have or reasons why the eviction should not happen. Um, you do receive this paperwork. Again, we stress you should immediately contact an attorney because of that short timeline. So please visit stayhousedla.org. After that process begins, you'll have to prepare and organize the evidence that was spoken about earlier in this presentation. So any copies of your pay stubs or bank statement statements or medical records related to your COVID-related financial distress, or any essential witnesses, and then be um, brought up during the discovery period, you may have an opportunity to negotiate with your landlord, or it may go to trial, in which case, again, you really want to have an attorney on your side. I know you cut out in a couple places there, but I think the big takeaway is if you get a summons and complaint or you get a notice to go to court, uh, definitely go to the stayhousedla.org website and, and try to contact an attorney. Um, great. Uh, Sarah, so a question that uh, a lot of people have, can the landlord just go ahead and, and increase, uh, increase a tenant's rent? So that really depends on where the tenant lives and what kind of building they live in. If you live in the city of Los Angeles, your residence might be covered by the LA Rent Stabilization Ordinance. Um, and if it is, your landlord cannot increase rent from March 30th, 2020 through 12 months after the end of the local emergency period, which is still going. To find out if your unit is subject to the Rent Stabilization Ordinance, text RSO to 1-855-880-7368. There is also a rent freeze on residential housing and mobile homes uh, covered by the Los Angeles County Rent Stabilization Ordinance, which applies to multifamily housing, um, so housing with um, multiple units, built before February 1995 in unincorporated areas of LA County. Any rent increase effective after March 4th, 2020 is invalid. Um, and then your landlords, under the county ordinance, your landlords also cannot impose new um, charges on their tenants to make up the cost of various fees or improvements. And at stayhousedla.org, there are resources that can tell you about the specific laws that apply to your city, or if you're in unincorporated LA, the county laws. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, can you answer this question that I think a lot of folks uh, have? Can a landlord just enter a tenant's unit uh, while these eviction bans uh, are in place? So your landlord must provide 24 hours for entering your unit. 
they cannot show your unit without their consent to rent. Um, but your landlord is entitled to enter your unit to respond to an emergency or to make repairs or alters that are necessary or that you have agreed or requested. Again, they must provide that 20 before they enter your unit, however. Thank you. Um, but what if um, maybe Caitlin, you could you can follow up on this. What if uh, the landlord seems to be trying to enter my uh, tenant's unit, uh, and it's part of an ongoing campaign of maybe harassment? Could you discuss a little bit about um, whether or not a landlord could be harassing a tenant, and and maybe what some options that tenants have in those types of situations? Right. So a landlord's right of entry into the unit is a form of harassment is illegal. Um, so in January 2021, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors provided a list of examples of harass specific to COVID-19, but also examples that we see. Pen. So that can include over entering your unit without notice, with notice, but very often repeatedly offering to to leave your unit, discriminating against you in any way, or even asking you about your citizenship status, asking you about your social, your sexual orientation, asking you about your marital status or your HIV status. All of those are examples of illegal harassment. If you're experiencing that, please contact an attorney or you can contact a tenant's rights organization like SAGE, S-A-G-J-E, or the Los Angeles Tenants Union, a complaint with HCID um, by phone or on their website. Um, their phone number is 866-557-7368. Um, not to document any harassment, um, especially if it's in writing, via text message or emails, and you'll want to provide that to your attorney or to the tenants' rights organizations that you're reaching out to. Thank you. Um, maybe we can also move the slide. And, and so this is the slide uh, which talks about the resources uh, for tenants uh, that are being harassed. Uh, thank you. Um, with that, I think if we could move to the next slide, I think we there's a visual there that I think I'd like to show um, all of the viewers. Uh, Sarah, can you talk about what a lockout is and who can lock a tenant out of their unit? Absolutely. So legally, only the sheriff can lock you out of your unit. Your landlord has to go through the process of filing an eviction against you, winning that eviction case, and getting a notice to vacate and a lockout order. So that takes a while and it will take more than the amount of time that's on the first notice to quit that you'll receive if your landlord um, decides to bring an eviction against you. So if this notice is on your door, it means that the, there has been a case filed against you and this is it has progressed to this point. Um, however, landlords don't always follow the law and landlords might decide to um, lock you out of your unit without following following the court procedures that are required. Um, and if your landlord does that, for example, by just changing the locks or preventing you from accessing your unit, um, you should contact an attorney right away. This uh, number at the bottom of the screen is the phone number for the illegal lockout hotline that can assist you if your landlord is not letting you get into your unit. You should also contact a tenant's rights organization like SAGE or the Los Angeles Tenants Union. Um, and same with the, as with the harassment cases, if you live in the city of Los Angeles, file a complaint with the Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department um, by phone or on their website. If you live within LA County, but outside of the city, file a complaint with the Los Angeles County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. But just remember that you will not be legally locked out until your landlord has followed all of the procedures for going to court. Thank you. 
Um, Anthony, I wanted to follow up on uh, something that you had said at the very beginning, but I wanted to highlight it again because it's a question that, that we have received. Can you just clarify if a tenant has, has uh, relatives or somebody else that has had to move in with them because of the pandemic, uh, perhaps with pets, um, can the landlord just try to evict them because of that? So it's going to, again, depend on where you live. If you're in the city of Los Angeles or in just LA County and the city that you live in doesn't have an ordinance, the county ordinance would then govern the situation. And under the county ordinance and the city of LA ordinance, you cannot evict a tenant, uh, landlord cannot evict a tenant based on having an unauthorized pet or unauthorized occupants for reasons related to COVID-19. And again, and for all these defenses, I want to make clear that um, yeah, you know, that's the law, but landlords will still try and go ahead with evictions. They'll still serve notices. And so you will have to raise these defenses um, if it goes proceeds to a trial. And that's why, again, it's so important to have an attorney there with you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, we have one more slide uh, that if we can move to the next slide, because it has the phone numbers, uh, again, for everybody to, to be able to contact um, us or contact folks at uh, Stay Housed LA, which is something that you've heard about uh, throughout uh, throughout this presentation. Um, with that, um, Madeline, there might be some questions uh, for for our team members, and so I'll um, I'll pass this to you. Sure. Thank you guys so much. I know it's a lot of information, so we're really happy that this can be reviewed again. Just to keep in mind, this is state specific. So when in doubt, it's better to reach out to stayhousela.org. Um, you can go to that website. Um, but I will. I do have some questions I wanted to ask. Um, so what if a landlord is offering to forgive all the tenants' rent in exchange for and offering a couple of thousand dollars to leave? How should someone handle that? Anthony, maybe you could answer that question. Yeah. So it, it, it really depends. First of all, you're under no obligation to accept a so-called what they're called cash for keys agreement. Um, so just because your landlord offers it doesn't mean you have to accept it. Um, and with that said, it's a you know it's really a case by case situation. You have to take into account your factors. You know how much rent, how much is the rent that that you pay monthly? Is it is are you in a rent controlled unit and pay a low monthly rent? You know um, how much back rent do you do you owe? Um, there are also rental assistance organizations out there that can help with covering some of, some or all of the uh, back rent that's owed. So, it, it, you know, it's a case by case situation and, and you have to really think about the, the costs and benefits. Um, if you're in the city of L.A., however, uh, for instance, there are that there are uh, amounts set uh, by the city that a landlord, if they're trying to do a cash for keys offer, would have to comply with um, in terms of. Well, let me rephrase. If it's a situation where the landlord. Um, is that is offering an amount because they want to um, demolish the unit or something like that, or they want to have an owner move in to the unit. There are amounts set by the city that that they would have to um, offer the tenant. So sometimes recently, in fact, we had a situation where a tenant was offered four thousand uh, dollars to move out, um, but the tenant was probably entitled to upwards of 20,000 by set by the city. So you have to, again, consider all those factors um, that are involved and, and make and really think about the decision. Okay, thank you. As, as I'm now learning, it really pays to be informed because you may not have all that information that you do need to allocate for yourself. Um, can a landlord charge late fees? No. So the state law is, is, is expressly states that there are no late fees allowed at this point. Mm -hmm. And that will last in June of 2021. Okay, that's good to know. And then can a landlord demand that somebody turn over a stimulus check that they receive? I can go ahead and answer this question. 
Um, sure. So in the city of Los Angeles, your landlord cannot ask or require you to use your stimulus money or money from other government relief programs for rent. In LA County, the county has not directly addressed this issue on whether or not a landlord can collect stimulus money. However, if you've properly informed your landlord that you're unable to pay rent due to COVID-19, your landlord cannot harass you or intimidate, intimidate you to turn over stimulus money or any other funds. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you for all of that information. Um, I didn't know if you felt like you wanted to revisit anything that maybe you didn't talk enough about, um, even though it seems like you know we covered a lot of information um, just, you know, if there's something you feel like you get frequently that you'd like to chat a little bit more or here we are at the end, maybe ask some people who joined a little bit late. Is there anything you want to revisit? I think the, the main thing that we want to stress uh, for tenants is that there are some limited protections um, right now. But we don't want folks to hear a uh, moratorium on uh, evictions and think that they don't need to respond or they don't need to take actions to protect themselves. And they can be very confusing um, because there's a lot of different laws at place and they interact in different ways. Uh, so with that, we definitely want to encourage our viewers reach out. Uh, there is an army of attorneys and paralegals and, and organizers that are uh, here in the city uh, looking to help tenants. So we definitely want folks to reach out, um, go back and look at the recording where we've identified some of those resources and, and, and do that. Um, I think that's, that is our, that's the big main takeaway from this. Um, we do know uh, tenants are struggling also uh, financially, and we did have some slides in there that really talk about where to start uh, looking for that additional assistance. So we encourage folks um, who can't pay rent because of COVID to also look into those options as well. Okay, thank you. And then I wanted to, we had some questions in the comments and I actually wanted to ask you a little bit more about those questions. Um, so we had a viewer, a viewer asked about um, a verbal rent increase. And I know we touched about and um, talked about this, but I'm kind of curious. Um, she had specifically mentioned it was a verbal request. Is there like a rule of thumb that anytime your landlord communicates with you that you should ask and say, you know, please put this in writing or, you know, I would, is there any kind of response that's standard while you're getting that information? Um, do you have any advice on that? Anthony or Sarah, do you want to take that question? Is is the question whether or not somebody should always ask for something in writing? Is that yeah. sort of the- It should you know, be in or? writing, but it, and I believe the question was, was the two week notice for a 20% increase, which is illegal. So first of all, anything above a 10% re uh, increase would require 60 day notice. So just that fact makes this illegal. Um, and again, it depends um, what city, if you're in LA, uh, there, uh, there are no rent increases at this time, and it'll last through the, through the end of the local emergency period. Um, and I believe uh, the same is true if you're in unincorporated part of LA County, uh, there are no rent increases at this time either. Okay. So for a so variety of reasons, that's an illegal, um, uh, request or order for a rent increase. That's, that's not an appropriate one. Okay. So I do want to take this moment to just remind people that everyone's situations are, as you can see, like it depends on where you live and um, particular circumstances that were requested. So to remind you to check in um, with these organizations, like with Stayhouse LA, with Inner City Law, so you're not, um, you know, just taking this information and running with it from here. Um, but I do actually more specifically would like to understand, so if someone showed up at, you know, if I was living in an apartment and some my landlord said these things to me, is um, I would be unsure of how to respond, is, you know, wondering like, if I say yes, does that mean I understand it, I'm paying it? Or if I acknowledge receipt, does that tie me to anything? Um, so in general, like with communications, you know, is there any kind of advice that you just general you know, if someone gives you that information, you just say, thank you, I'll get back to you. 
Um, I know that sounds really pedantic, but uh, you know maybe that's useful to people to understand how they can communicate and feel confident that they're not committing and that they're also not dismissing. I think, I think that's always a good practice. And I'll, if anybody else wants to jump in, I'll let them jump in as well. Uh, that's always a good practice because if uh, a landlord is, is approaching you with something and you don't have a full understanding of, of what the your legal rights are, and, and again, referring folks to all these different um, resources available to them, um, you know, you could you could take a, a misstep. So it's it's always better to to try and reach out. Okay, and then um, I think there was another question um, that came up while we were talking. So this question is posted on the screen now. Um, someone had asked if their landlord illegally increased our rent and they've made a and we've made a demand for it back. Do they need to pursue a mediator before going to small claims? And they want to know if HC IDLA is a mediator. Again, I will. If anybody else wants to jump in, I think this is a. Uh, a fairly specific type of situation. Um, and so I think there's some details in there that we would need to, to know about. Um, I think, again, uh, if, if we can put back up toward, uh, towards the end of the slide, um, please feel free to reach out through State House or reach out to the Inner City Law Center. Thank you very much. Okay. So I don't see any other questions that are popping up. Um, they did additional rental increases. Yeah, so I, I don't have anything else for you guys. So if, I feel like if you feel that you've covered it, um, you know, revisited topics, then we're good to wrap it up. One, uh, well, thank you for having us and giving us this opportunity uh, to reach a wider set of tenants who may not have otherwise thought to reach out. Um, and, you know, again, just reminding everybody that the information that we've given today is just a general overview, uh, not specific legal advice. Somebody shouldn't just take it and run with it. And also it's uh, sort of up to date as of now. Um, and again, the legal landscape in this space is uh, changing um, as is our world. And so, um, you know, definitely again, reach out if you have questions in the future. Thank you guys so much. And just oh, in closing, um, we really appreciate your time and expertise. We just want to remind our viewers that when in doubt, definitely reach out to um, stayhousela.org or some of the other organizations mentioned here. You know, as a resident here, you have rights and, you know, please self-advocate and go and find out about what your rights are um, through these resources. Um, we will, just a little note, we will be looking to produce this program in Spanish, so stay tuned if you feel like that might be useful for somebody that you know. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time.